Welcome to Use the Types episode 12, Displaying Our Applications Environment. We can now serve static content and generate dynamic content in our application. And we're now building up to adding some real functionality to our app. And typically web apps will store some state somewhere. And this is done to persist information and state across page loads and so on. We're going to follow the very common approach of storing state in a relational database. But first, we need to investigate how Heroku communicates its configuration settings to our app. As we'll find out, Heroku does this using environment variables. So we will eventually be configuring a Postgres database dyno in Heroku, and Heroku will then use environment variables to pass the credentials to that database into our app. So let's look at how we access environment variables in our application. So as always, we'll open up a terminal, go to our source directory, to create a directory for our application and we are going to grab a snapshot with the source code from the last episode here we go we'll initialize a git repo add the code commit the first iteration we're going to run our little dev script that we created previously to set up our dev tools. Okay, we have Intero installed. We're going to start up VS Code. So here is our application. We'll go back to our main.hs and we'll start up ghcid. This is telling us that we need to build to bring in the ginger dependency. So let's do that before we do anything else. Stack build fast. Okay, everything's built. Got VS Code open. We're going to do control back tick to start our integrated terminal as we usually do. And we'll run a little ghcid helper script. Should all type check. Great. We'll do control B just to minimize the project view down left hand side we don't need this right now and then control back tick just to hide the terminal it's running our web server on point eight thousand okay so we are going to add a few imports to our app so first and foremost we're going to import some stuff from control.monad.io.class Specifically, we're going to import the monad io type class. And then we're going to import the get environment function. So a few comments about that. So get environment is to the function that runs in io and returns all of the environment variables that are in current session. And monad io is a type class that we'll use to gain access to the lift io function, which will, will allow us to invoke io actions from within our handler. So let's scroll down to our handler, show info, see it's monad snap. Monad snap is a type class, and it's a specialized context for snap action handlers. And it also includes monad io. So you can perform io in monad snap, you just need to lift your actions into IO and that's why we imported monad IO. So in show info then we're going to add do because we're going to perform more than one action and we're going to have a local variable mvars and we're going to invoke get environment by lifting it with lift IO. And then we are going to add 
an entry to the dictionary that we're passing to our view. Um, we'll call it nvars new field. And we're just going to pass nvars to it. We'll save, and that should still compile. Look at that. Still compiles. It's great. We're listening to port 8000 still automatically. So now we have the environment variables in our app, we are going to modify our view, which is up here, underscore info.html. We're just going to correct a couple of things first. So I realized after the fact, after looking at this the other day, that we we're not really escaping strings properly. So Ginger, the templating language we're using, has filters, and escape is a very useful one. And you can think of it as being like a pipeline of operations. So we're taking the value of title, we're piping it into the escape filter, and it's just a function which takes a string and escapes it for HTML. So there are no, um, so any special characters in title don't corrupt the HTML layout. So every string that we interpolate in the output, we should really escape like this. So we have that view now. However, we're gonna blow away this loop here. We don't really care about these items anymore. And we're going to add a secondary header, environment. We're going to insert a table. We'll give it a class M so we can style it. And then using a for loop, we're going to loop over the nvars field that we added previously. And we're also going to sort it. So there's a sort filter. So nvars will be sorted by the key first value in the tuple in this case which is the name of the environment variable we'll terminate our for with an n4 like that and then for each entry in nvars we're going to create a row in our table a tr element and it will consist of a th and then we're going to use typewriter font to display the zeroth element of the tuple which is the name of the environment variable so entry brackets zero and we're going to properly escape that using the escape filter and there is our th element i'm going to copy that and we're going to make a td element which will be the oneth or the second element of the tuple which is the value of the environment variable we'll save that and then to make our table look a little bit prettier we're going to add a style element at the top of our document in the head and we're going to style the m class th elements within m and the td elements within m like this and all we're really going to do for now is left align the text so the table looks you know vaguely acceptable save that and our app's already being served at port 8000 on localhost let's open a browser let's go and visit our app This will give the home page, which is the current time, but the info action is under slash info. And there it is, all of our environment variables. So you see things like GHC package path, but you know, that looks okay. They're all sorted in a nice order. We've got bold headings. They're all in a typewriter font, monospaced. So there we go. So we've been able to view the results on our local app. Now let's publish it to Heroku to see what Heroku does. So I'm going to close the browser for now, and we're going to head back to the terminal. Its status shows us the changes we've made. There you go. Let's commit those. There we go with the commit message. So this is the newly created Git repo. So there's not currently a an Heroku app associated with it. So the Heroku config command will show us this. There you go, missing required flag. It, it needs an app to run the command against and it can't infer it from the Git repo. So you can list your Heroku apps with Heroku apps. And I have an app here, Secure Woodland. It's the name of the app. Um, if you don't already have an app, you'll be able to figure out how to build that from one of my previous videos but the long and the short of it is you would use the heroku create command and you need to specify the 
Heroku build pack, which is something like that. So that would create a new app at that location. And if you haven't already authenticated with Heroku, the Heroku CLI will pop up the browser. You'll type in your username, password, uh, two-factor authentication co code, all that kind of stuff. And then it'll, be, it'll get your credentials and you'll be able to publish to your app. But we already have an application here, secure-woodland-624101, but it's not associated with our application because of the config. In fact, we can even tell by doing a git remote minus v and we have no remotes associated with our app. So we're going to use the Heroku git remote subcommand to associate this randomly generated blah, 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 this randomly generated app name with our git repository. There you go. Set git remote Heroku to blah. If you do git remote minus v, you'll see there is now a remote by the name of Heroku, which points to this Git repository. Now, all that's left to do is to push to that branch. Now, I've already pushed stuff to this app before, so I suspect if I do the standard push command, it's going to complain about some commits being out of whack. Yeah, here we go. This is because uh, there are some refs, you know, Git refs already at that repo. Now, if you get in this situation and you just want to blow away whatever is on the Heroku remote, you can just do a minus F to force push. Either way, you know, you do git push Heroku master if there are no existing commits or minus F to overwrite any existing ones. And if you're just adding new commits, so you shouldn't have to do a minus F either. So let's do that. And this should push and deploy the app. And this might take a while the first time you run it. I have no idea how long it's going to take right now. So it's pushing the code. And it's going to start building the app. Oh, there we go, building the source. If you haven't built your app there before, you will probably find it will take a longer, a lot longer to build because it'll have to pull in all of the stack packages from Hackage and perform the build and all that kind of stuff. Right now, this should be fairly quick, I hope. And once it's up there, we can go and visit our app in the browser. building the code it's already detected the GHC that we used previously I think yep and publishing the binaries to the right place it's finished so it's just sort of cycling the app you know bouncing the server or whatever when this when this finished we can then go and visit this URL in our browser so I'm going to copy that wait to this to wait for this to finish oh there we go so there's our home page current time I'm going to go to info and there we have it a whole bunch of environment variables you can see dyno which is a variable created specifically by Heroku it identifies the I know the web worker a whole bunch of other stuff so as we'll see in future videos this is how Heroku will pass in credentials to databases thanks very much for watching